Well, the US uh, President Joe Biden is arriving here in Paris today, ahead of the commemorations tomorrow. We can show you uh, live images, in fact, from the airport where he's due to arrive very shortly. The day, well, a day of fear and war for many, of course, of the local people living in towns across northern France. D-Day, as it was uh, nearly uh, 80 years ago, will be tomorrow. Solange Mouja has the story for us now of two local survivors on that fateful day. It was not a day one forgets. On June 6, 1944, this Norman sky trembled with the sound of bombers. Michel Le Tourneur was 10. She hid with her parents. Yves Ecobichon also lived through it. He was eight. At around four or five in the morning, the sky along the coast that we see here was full of flames. The noise was horrible. We were scared, very, very scared. The bombs were falling. This is D-Day. Unlike some 20,000 Norman civilians, Eve miraculously survived. As bombs fell upon his family farm, he and his parents sought shelter in a field. 500,000 falling bombs. That stays with you. It's hard to talk about. It's painful. It's painful for everyone. It still hurts? Yes. Oh, yes. Michel Le Tourneur also nearly died. She and her parents hid in a trench. But approaching American soldiers feared Germans were hiding there. They threw in a grenade. The trench where we hid was right here in this dip. There were flames. The village seamstress said, little Mimi, we're going to die. A neighbor saved the injured 10-year-old and took her to a field hospital set up by the U.S. Army. There was just skin holding it in place. If I hadn't had a coat, the arm would have been gone. Michelle was hospitalized for months on end, but she remains thankful to the American soldiers. Freedom doesn't always come by way of comfort. Some paid dearly, but if they hadn't come, where would we be? That's what I keep saying. With memories of that fateful day, Michelle and Eve commemorate every year all those that did not survive, be it friends, family, neighbors, and soldiers from far off shores. Solange Mujan there with that report. We're going to talk about it a lot more now in today's perspective. Of course, thousands of troops killed on that first day alone, D-Day, and far more over the coming weeks, the largest naval, air and land operation in history. And we're going to remember the men and women who gave their lives for the survival of Europe as we know it. And with me here on set is Curtis Young, historian and professor of literature at the Ursek Business School. Thanks very much for being with us. Lovely to us. be here with you. I mean, the sheer scale of what was planned by the Allies was incredible yeah. here, wasn't it? And no real proof at all that this was actually going to work. No, there wasn't. This was, a, this was the largest air, sea and land operation in, in, in all of history. Uh, and it's one of those things where every piece of it had to work or would fall apart. Uh, uh, so the whole idea of having the Germans think that in fact that the evasion was going to come from Calais, mm -hmm. uh, that entailed building dummy tanks and airplanes and, and, and creating fake communications and, and that sort of thing, which fortunately that happened. This, uh, this the, the actual uh, landing at Normandy was it, it was, it was Roosevelt's idea. Uh, Churchill resisted it for a long, long, long time. Churchill's idea is he wanted to uh, come through the Mediterranean, uh, do Sicily and Italy, and basically refight the war in the Balkans. And it really came down to uh, uh, a decisive moment where, where, where uh, Roosevelt and Eisenhower and, and Omar Bradley were able to, to override Churchill to make this thing happen, and, and, and boy, oh boy, we pulled it off. I mean, certainly thinking about when you see the images as well, we've got some of them uh, being played behind you and on screen while you're talking. Imagine what it must have been like being in one of those landing craft, coming across, knowing that you were going to meet a maybe confused uh, enemy, but yeah. a well-prepared enemy. Well, the, yeah, the thing is, is that they thought with all of the, the, the bombing that was happening over Normandy uh, in the days preceding uh, uh, June 6th, the bombing, uh, all of the, uh, the work of the resistance that was going on, they didn't realize that the Germans were so well uh, bunkered in 
that they had built, built these concrete fortifications, and they were basically they were basically sitting ducks coming in. It was just it was just an, it was a bloodbath. It was it was extraordinary. It's, it's amazing that with the losses that there weren't more, mm. and and this was not the end. This was the beginning of the end. Uh, as, so to speak, because the Germans really resisted uh, for, for a, quite, a, quite a while. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a, an incredible yeah. event to, to look back on. And of course, the U.S. effort was very, very vital, very important to this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. It, this, this, is, this, is, this was the United States, this was Britain, this was Canada who was involved. But the, who, who uh, came up with the idea of overlord, who uh, supplied it, manned it, this sort of thing, uh, was, was, was the United States. This, in fact, was, it's interesting, Winston Churchill at one point said that he was not uh, brought in as prime minister by the king to reside over the fall, the end of the British Empire. But in fact, the end of the British Empire, as we had known it, really happened on that day. Huh? Going into the war, Britain was really the power. Uh, America was, was, was sort of a common market. Britain, a fifth of the world's population was under the British flag at the time. This was going into the war. But slowly but surely, with the American economic force, the fact that, that uh, they, we were the guys who were building the bombs and the airplanes and this sort of thing, Britain was slowly seeking and falling into, into recession. Uh, their their GNP, G, GDP was falling. And by the time we got to this point, Britain had no choice but to, to finally listen to the Americans and let over, Overlord happen. And what happens is that really is the end of, of, of the British Empire as we'd known it. Yeah, such a tipping point in so many, yeah, different, really was. So many different yeah. ways. I know you spent a lot of time um, documenting, notably, African-American soldiers killed in the First World yeah. uh, War here in France. But the same happened in World War II. There was even a, a black battalion, wasn't there, of U.S. soldiers? Yeah, what happened is, is the, the advance that happened in World War II, in, going back to World War I, huh? Wilson did not want black soldiers in combat. He did not want them trained in combat. His argument was, I'm not going to arm black men to go to Europe and kill white people, even though it's our German enemy. So they came up with this idea of the fact that, well, what do the, what do the black guys do? They work. So they created this thing called the Service of Supply, the SOS, where the black soldiers were given no combat training whatsoever, that they were the guys who were going to load and unload the ship, bury the dead, build the roads, maintain the railroads, look after the horses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was, however, before Wilson, the 369th uh, Regiment uh, out of Harlem. The, this was 2,000 black soldiers, well-trained, who fought in the French army. They were loaned to the 4th French Army by, uh, by Pershing. And, and these guys were in combat longer than any American soldiers, 191 days. They won the Croix de Guerre from France. 171 of the soldiers individually won Croix de Guerre. It was fantastic, not, it, not acknowledged at all by the Americans. So when we get to World War II, the SOS becomes what we call the Quartermaster Corps. That is, they're going to do exactly the same thing. These are the guys who drove the trucks heroically in the Red Ball Express. Uh, these are the guys who, who, who supplied, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was one unit that was created that people don't know much about, the 329th. And these are the guys, all black soldiers, who uh, deployed and manned the barrage balloons mm -hmm. that, fl that flew over, uh, over the norm, uh, uh, Omaha and Utah uh, beach in order to prevent the, uh, the German Luftwaffe from strafing the beaches at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, unsung heroes again. Uh, one of them, in fact, and I think probably you had a previous guest who might have spoken of this yeah, man whose name I can't think of yeah. just now, a medical student in the medical corps, badly wounded on the beach, but in fact, despite his wounds, saved the lives of over 200 guys that he looked after. Uh, once again, overlooked by the American military, by the American officials. He won the Purple Heart, but no Medal of Honor or anything, anything of distinction. Bearing in mind everything we've talked about over the last five minutes, why do you think it's so important to remember and commemorate uh, today and tomorrow what happened? I think I think it's important. I think there's. I saw an article in Le Monde Diplomatique this week by uh, Dominique de Villepin, a brilliant article where he says war is not a shortcut to peace. I think it's important that we commemorate this in terms of a of a cautionary tale, because if you look at what's going on, we are in the same place we were 20 years before World War One. 
I think we need to look at this and to, to think about what are we doing? Where are we? Because we are, uh, Dominic de Villepin says it very well, we are really on the verge. We're in, in a sense, in World War III. Uh, Donald Tusk, the, 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 the Polish prime minister, just two months ago said we're no longer in a post-war period. We're in a pre-war period. So I just, I think D-Day needs to remind us of the horror of war. But think about the lives, because who suffer the most in war are women and children. I, I, as a historian, I don't see a war that has solved the problems of the world. I see the war, world, this, this actually is the end of the second 30 years war, 1914, 1945. And, and here, we, here we go again. So I think we need to look at this as, as a wake up call to do we wanna do this again. Curtis Young, thanks so much for being with us on the programme. Curtis Young, historian and professor of literature at the Ursate Business School. Just before we leave, just going to show you very quickly uh, pictures of Joe Biden, who's arrived on the time there talking to the French Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal. We'll continue to follow that, uh, of course, as Biden arrives for D-Day. <laughs>